everyone. Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. It is, uh, I want to make sure I'm doing this right because we were recording this on Tuesday. It is Thursday, August 26th, the uh, third beautiful Thursday morning, I'm assuming, if the weather predictions are correct. Uh, we are in our very first season three political roundtable, and we are bringing in a friend of the show, a friend of the family, uh, a friend of my uh, husband, who I got introduced to Jeremy uh, from, uh, but he came on to do a test run. The audio screwed up. We weren't able to release the uh, episode, but he has graciously accepted the second invitation onto the show. So thank you so much, Jeremy Woolard, for coming onto the show and doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Not a problem, Chris. It's Woolward, not Woolard. Woolward. Woolward. Okay. Woolward. Woolward. Yes, Woolward. <laughs> Well, I, I, word. I knew that. I'm not writing that down right now as we say that <laughs> word. Um, All good. All Jer good. Jeremy, you and I, uh, we both like politics. We're very, uh, I think we, we keep a fine tooth comb on what is happening politically across this country here in Alberta, but also here in the city of Calgary. Um, we, we also both, and this is the great thing, we both live in this, uh, the federal riding of Calgary Skyview. We live in Absolutely. the same federal uh, provincial riding of Calgary Falcon Ridge. And we also yep. live in the same municipal <laughs> district of oh, Ward I know, right? Like how, does that, like, how does that work out? I exactly. It's like we're kindred neighbors. So we have, we have, three... and we're both wearing red tonight. Exactly. For those who are watching this right now, they can see that we're watching. Uh, we're, I'm wearing red. For those who aren't, well, we're, you got to take us at our word. But hey, we're not saying vote liberal because we're wearing red. We're just saying we're both wearing red. And it's not even liberal red. It's like a burgundy red. Exactly. But, it's like a Star Trek command red. We're, we're not the first off the island, though. Okay? <laughs> yeah, no, we're definitely not the first off the island. So we're all good. Um, so I, I, I want to talk about two things first in the first segment of the show and that is the biggest news story that is happening across Canada right now which is the federal election before the interview started I asked you and you you were up front you we I said you are fluid with your vote you don't you are not locked into one party and nope. you're willing to vote for the person with the best uh policies I'm assuming and I am too I want to ask this up front were you shocked that there was an election called? Were you upset that there was an election called? Um, no, actually, I'm not shocked or surprised. I kind of figured it was coming. Minority governments tend to flirt with the idea of an election every uh, and that two year on that two year mark and two years into their term. So I'm not surprised that the uh, federal government, the prime minister, decided to visit the governor general, dissolve parliament and send us all to the polls. I have to question whether or not it was the smartest move. The last time we had a September election, uh, as far as I can recall, was back in 2000 when the newly formed Canadian Alliance decided to poke the bear that was uh, Prime Minister Cretien at the time and force everybody to the polls. And... Um, yeah, go and see. And then that in that 2000 election, 21 years ago, became the Seinfeld of elections. Really, the whole election about nothing. The it's, whole election about nothing, but also the Liberals went on to win a larger majority than they had in 97. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, they did. They won, they won a larger majority. Uh, it was the big, well, it was the uh, nail in the coffin of Stockwell Day's political career. And I, think, I think we all can remember the wetsuit on the jet ski. <laughs> sure do. Down as he's representing uh, Kamloops Kilchina back there. As I say, I followed that because, well, Kamloops was where I was born. So I remember that, the infamous jet ski moment, pull up to a press conference in there. It's like, sure, you might have the physique to fit into a wetsuit, but how is that actually going to translate to votes? I don't think your social conservative base was really going to buy it. And no. yeah, so nailing his nail in his coffin, ended his career, kind of gave birth to where he eventually became the CPC. So it's interesting 21 years later how what happened then manifesting itself today and some of the fun, some interesting parallels. 
between that 2000 and also between 2008, when Prime Minister Harper had a minority, decided he was going to roll the dice and dissolve parliament. And that spectacularly backfired in his, in his face. And that became three years of some very dysfunctional government. <laughs> Well, and if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, you probably know a little bit, uh, my mind's not with me right now, but right after that election, that was the election that Stefan Dion, Jack Layton, and Jill Duceppe right afterwards said, we don't have faith in the government, we just had an election, we have more seats than you, we're going to go to the Governor General and say we are going to have a unity government to work together, and it turned into Harper's worst nightmare. Oh, absolutely, because I see. He couldn't get he couldn't get the confidence of the house. Um, he couldn't get consensus. Like say, moment those polls were closed, uh, Stefan Zion and Jack Layton, like they were the two big the two big push. Giuseppe went along because well, Giuseppe wanted to feel relevant, I guess, outside of Quebec. But um, <laughs> pushing the pushing the efforts to again pr- propose to the governor general say yeah you know what let us form we have. We have the seats, we have the votes, but now it's going to be um, Harper proroguing Parliament, going back, working out a new budget, scrapping his old one, and trying to tinker for every single push for every single vote he could po- he he could possibly get. And like I say, couple prorogues, then 2011 rolls, and he finally got the majority he wanted. Yeah, but now, the now damage was done. Exactly. And it's a little bit different now because Aaron O'Toole, the conservative leader, and Jagmeet Singh, the NDP leader, were very much in the, hey, we don't trust Justin Trudeau. We don't want Justin Trudeau. We want to stop everything that he's doing because he's hurting Canadian government, uh, the Canadian people. But when they went to the polls, when Justin Trudeau said, hey, we're going to go to the polls, it seemed to be a little bit of a fake angriness that Jagmeet Singh and Aaron O'Toole had with, why would you call the election? Parliament was working. How did you feel when you heard Jagmeet Singh and Aaron O'Toole talk about the the the, the anger that they had when it came to uh, an election call? You know what, Chris, to be perfectly honest, I don't really pay, I didn't pay too much attention to the bravado or the outrage or anything else of the sort. I Just because I say, we live in Alberta. Like I got to listen to, we could listen to it in Alberta politics forever. And I listened to it for four years from the, op, from the, the more vocal opposition we had here in Alberta. And I'm never going to forget back in 2017, when I visited the assembly as a guest of NDP MLA, Marie Renault, where I'm sitting above the opposition benches and I'm listening to Rick McIver and Derek Kildebrandt being, turning on their typical rage machine an anger machine, and then McIver's under his breath, like, well, we're so confident, call an election, blah, 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 blah. But yet, they'd all, they'd all be like, oh, you don't call election, no, this is, this is irresponsible, blah, blah. But at the same time, they're going to want one. Yeah. So, it's for, you know, it's for show. It's all, it's, it's, it's all about theatrics. They need, they need the reaction because they have to, because it's the part, it's the part they play. But at the end of the day, they want, at the end of the day, they know they're going to go to the polls. Everyone's working behind the scenes. You got strategists doing their thing. And honestly, at the end of the day, if I were to tell voters something, it's like, guys, if you get all, if they get outraged, like, oh, they get mad at the house and then get their campaigning. I'm like, don't. It's a, it's a red, it is very much a red herring. It's a distraction from the actual issues. I don't necessarily agree we need it to go to the polls right away, but the reality is, is we are. The reality is it's going to happen. And you know what? We get to we get to have our, our say on September 20th when we go to the ballot boxes. If you're not a fan of how the prime minister called this election or whatever the case may be, you're gonna have you're gonna have your say. If you want uh, Mr. O'Toole or Mr. Singh or whomever. There's your chance to put that X by X by the name. Like you forgot Miss Paul. Anime Paul could be next prime minister of Canada. Okay, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, if you believe that, then I'll tell you that Jason Kenny has a plan for COVID. If you believe she yeah. So 
There you go. Let's. I'm trying not to laugh out loud because if I did, I'd snort because that comment was perfect. Well, there you go. It's like there's we're not we're we're, we're we're in Canada. We don't need a Brooklyn Bridge. It's like you believe that Jason Kenny has a plan to solve our COVID crisis. Exactly. But he, yeah, he has a he has a plan to get our oil to market tomorrow. Don't you know? Like, come on. Oh. Oh gosh! <laughs> but I, I, I do want to I do want to uh, pick up on something that you just mentioned because I found it quite interesting as well. Um, Aaron O'Toole and the Conservatives were like, Justin Trudeau's not paying attention to the economy. They're not paying attention to the COVID. They're filming ads for this gener- the next general election, which was going to be called within a week's time. And right. the thing the thing that I found funny is the Conservatives were the first party with their whole platform out, with their commercials already filmed, edited, and ready to shoot, go. They had social media uh, ads ready to go. I'm sorry, your opposition and you're telling the government they had too much time to spend on government or on election ads when you have everything done? Bull. Bull yeah. crap. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's like, they all started, they all started with O'Toole's like new spring fling, like here I am. I'm gonna like run. I'm gonna have my legs of steel. But are they photoshopped? Are they this? Like, are you going to? Are we gonna go down that rabbit hole? I'm like, you get the emails. I get the emails. We all get the campaign emails, the fundraising emails. They always talk about elections. So my thing, and this is, I guess, to the un to, I would say maybe not the partisans. Let's be, let's be, let's be real. Not those who are going to sign up for campaign letters or fundraising letters. The, the average typical Canadian who is not going to spend that much time and know with every two, four years they're going to the ballot box. They're not seeing all this stuff. They don't know what's going on. So for them, it's like, don't get caught in the distraction. Just realize they've all planned for it. The government had the ability to call whether they should have waited for the house to dissolve through natural means or whether they forced it, that's going to be a question on September 20th. It's going to gamble for them. But like I say, I know I'm just kind of circling around, we're talking around circles here. So I, I, I do apologize. It's like they shouldn't get caught in the hype. Don't get no. caught in the bravado. It's getting, it's like, it's going to happen. This is life. And I, and I appreciate that. And I'm going to, I'm going to segue into a little bit of a, what you're hearing because uh, I, I I pride myself of trying to have my ear to the ground on what people are saying, what people are talking about when elections are called. But let's be honest, COVID has changed the name of the game and I'm not able to get out and talk to people as much as I used to. What are you hearing? What are you hearing from your family members? Are, are people uh, engaged in this uh, election, do you think? Or is it because it's in the middle of August and no one really cares because we're all on summer vacation? We're not going to start caring until probably September like 8th after kids are back in school. Yeah. And let's say, and in some parts of the country, parents are still not going to care after September 8th because they're going to freaking wonder how they're going to keep their kids safe. Like, or the Ontario and on like Alberta. (laughs) Yeah. Like Alberta. Like fourth wave. Oh, I'm sorry. Or you know what? Or to be perfectly serious, Chris, families in BC who's who've lost their homes in those in in those fires like some of those criticisms are 100 percent valid it's like you can call an election all you want your timing the timing was the timing was terrible but i think when i listen when i listen to people some of the stuff i hear is very knee-jerk like it's alberta let's just be real you and i are both in alberta we hear a lot of the same things we see the same people every day sharing the same messages every day and you know what some of them you need to be listening and they do it every day because people are not paying attention but then there are, then there are those who you know what they're in their camps they know who they're going to vote for it doesn't matter i have family they hear the name they hear the name trudeau and they already are like they would be they would be the same people that would you know, and no difference to my family. There'd be some people who go like to lock her up. They're, that's how hyper-partisan they can get. But well, I'm like, why are, it's like, 
are you looking at the issues? Are you looking at what they're talking about? Are you looking at how is this impacting you? Like I'm personally a big proponent of the fact that COVID-19 has completely shifted the status quo and has revealed 100% that the status quo doesn't work. It's the system is broken. Let's, you know what, I'm going to, I'm just going to say it and people want to get on me or harp on me for it. You know what? I don't care. I say to them, bring it. The status quo is fundamentally broken. COVID-19 has laid bare the inequalities and imperfections and huge flaws in the way we deliver social programs, in the way we deliver financial assistance, and even in the way how our economy works. And right, and right now, voters are going to decide whether the Trudeau government has spent the last year and a half actually ensuring that people are taken care of. They're going to decide whether he needs to continue or whether the, one of the opposition parties in need deserve, deserves a shot at it. And that's just the way it's going to be. Because if you take away the bravado, you take away all the fluff and all the, and all, and all the dramatics, take off the makeup, let's just look at it for what, for what it really is. People are scared. People are concerned. People need to make sure, people are worried. How am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to take care of my well-being? Am I going to have a job? Is there going to be a place for me as industries and technologies evolve? Is there a place for me in this, in this world? They're going to talk about, okay, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about social issues, long outstanding issues. For some communities, it's going to be about, am I going to actually have clean drinking water? The indigenous population, it's like, how are we going to actually atone or reconcile for the, pa the past atrocities? For the LGBTQ2S plus community, it's going to be, are we going to finally, once and for all, ban conversion therapy? Are they going to ban, are they going to finally get rid of the blood ban? Like, these are things that are matter. Like, you take away the fluff and all this stuff. This is stuff that actually matters. Persons with disabilities, big one. If you look around... You see all the provinces and what they're asked to live on. It's atrocious. Like, I'm appalled at how far and how long we've kicked this can down the road and not actually deal with it. So while everyone wants to talk about the low-hanging fruit, which are the big things, the big fluff, the great puff pieces that make for great headlines, really, at the end of the day, you got to be taking apart that and looking at the core of what's going on and I don't really believe a lot of people are looking at that big picture there are some I'm going to 100% say there's going to be people who are looking at this and looking at those issues and really gauging which which one of these leaders is going to have the fortitude to actually stand up and deal with it some are not and I wish more people were going to actually take the time to do their homework and actually read the platforms, listen to what's being said, and then challenge them. And then even if it's your own team, you have to be willing to challenge your team because you can't expect something from others if you're not willing to do it yourself. Plain could, and simple. Could not agree with you more, Jeremy. Um, this is a, a very unique uh, election. And I think you hit it right on the head a few times when you were talking there. One, we are living in a more hyper-politicized world than we have ever seen. We are seeing uh, people go to rallies, chant, scream, yell, swear at leaders of the three major parties. We are seeing the vicious, vicious people on social media when it comes to COVID-19 about mandatory uh, vaccinations. If you want to get on a plane, if you want to get on a train, uh, we are seeing businesses getting thrown under the bus because businesses are requiring vaccine. The Saddle Dome is just one of them. They came out this week and said, no, you have to have your vaccines, proof of vaccinations, and people are getting pissed. Um, the status quo that we had is no longer the status quo. We are now in a new world, and normal is not ever going to be the old normal. We are in a complete unknown territory right now, and the leaders are campaigning like we aren't. 
We have parties who are saying, let's go back. Let's recover to where we were. We have parties who are saying, hey, we need to still recover because we are potentially heading into a fourth wave, a potential fifth wave. Who knows? We also have a party that just is completely off the rails and doesn't know what who their party leader is right now. So we, we are in a political unknown. When I'm talking to people, when I'm talking to the people I've talked to, they say the same thing. There's no options to figure out where we want to go. People can come out with their platforms and everyone should read all the platforms. I read the conservative front to back when it came out. It was 180 pages of my life I want back because it was a, just a complete gong show. There are some great things in it, but at the same time, I'm not going to vote for them. So I wasn't looking at it that hard. I will be honest. I'm not going to vote for the other two major parties either. I don't know who I'm voting for because I'm still undecided on where I want this party country to go. And no, no party is giving me the option right now. Well, you know what, Chris? And I'm going to tell you, the last time we met and we were starting like nerding around, we mm. had some fun. Well, I'm going to throw another nerd. I'm going to throw another nerd moment out here. And I'm going to pretend for a moment that you that we're going to put we're going to put in as a little mise en scene. Your your command your commander Worf. Where this is a deep space nine moment. I'm going to put my hands behind my back, and I'm going to be the nice, mild, soft spoken Ezri Dax. And I'm going to recite to you the same things that Dax cited to Worf. And she's like, you know what? She said, my opinion: the Klingon Empire is dying, and I think it deserves to die. And he didn't like it. And then she continues to like, well, it's a society that's in deep denial about itself. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to, it's like, then she asked, are you, is there been a chancellor that you've ever supported? Has there been one you've actually respected? This is obviously paraphrasing because I really don't want Paramount to sue me for any of this, but anyway. Please, well, um, they would sue me because I had you on the show. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? Copyrights, copyrights, copyright. You never know. Anyway, great plug for Deep Space Nine. But my point is, and she's at the end, she's like, if you're willing to tolerate a system of government you know is corrupt, then what hope is there going to be for the Empire? It's like, that's... And then it's obviously, it took Worf to the position that, you know what, he's going to install Martok as Chancellor and deal with Gowron and all fun things there. I'm not suggesting that that's the way to go. We don't need to have honorable combat here. Although, you know what? Going I would, back to... Let's do it. Let's do the honorable combat. I'm you know what, sorry. though? If we were going to go back to, like, original Star Trek and, like, Hammock time, where Spock and Kirk had to go fight on Vulcan, like, the Caliphate, I, that would be kind of cool. But that's not how we do representative democracy in Canada. But I know. I know. I know. I know. Some days, some days you just think it might be the best way. But anyway, it's not. Um, that's just all nice fiction. However, her point, Dax's point remained. The question, the point that she had to say here is like, she was honored. She was still considered a part of the House of Martok. She was honored all this good fun stuff, but she wasn't sucked in the way her predecessors, Jadzia or Curzon were in the romanticism they had about the Klingons. We have to, as a society have to de-romanticize ourselves from the stereotypical way we view Canada and we have to fundamentally look at where we want this country to go. We absolutely need a dousing blast of cold water. You know what? We need, and then I guess another way, another nerd moment from, oh, I think it's the same, I guess it's in the same episode where Kira is talking to Damar and Damar is like, well, what kind of people sanction this? What type of people do this? And Kira looks at her with the complete sass that only the great Nana visitor could provide and be like, yeah, Damar, what kind of people? She and she's like, damn it. But Garrick's like, no, if we need to be a leader that we need him to be a blast of cold water doing so good, it makes him more receptive. The fact that we're hurting and we are, let's be real. People are one or two paychecks away from being evicted from their homes. Bankruptcies are on the high. People have lost their jobs. Unemployment rates are still high. They are recovering, but there are still a lot of people out of work who have stopped giving up, stopped, give, stopped looking. They gave up. It's like, if we're not taking care of them, if we're not, if we're not finding a way to address those inequalities and those big issues, then what hope is there for this country? Like, 
I don't mean to sound like, I don't mean to go on the hyperbole, but I don't think it is hyperbole when we're really looking at all this stuff that's been unearthed because we've had nothing else to do. All the stuff that we've kicked down the road for so long has now come home to roost. And it's all come home at once. Some people want to just would call it karma. I'm being a person of faith. You know what? Honestly, it feels like a reckoning. It feels like a trial, like a refiner's fire. Like it's a, it's a crucible. This is Canada's crucible. And this election should, should matter more than I feel it's ultimately going to be. However, there's a chance to turn that around, but it's not going to be Justin Trudeau. It's not going to be Jagmeet Singh. It's not going to be Anna-Marie Paul. It's not going to be Aaron O'Toole. It's not going to be whoever's leading the block. I don't even remember who. It's certainly not Eve, going to be uh, that. Eve Francais Blanchon or something like that. I forget, his, okay. I forget how to pronounce his name. I know who it is, but I just can't pronounce his name right well, now. Well, Mr. Eve Blanchard, if that's, if that's what sound, that might sound right. Here, Eve Blanchard. And it certainly ain't going to be Maxime Bernier who are going, who are going to bring people to the poll. No, what? no, it's not. What? I'm sorry. We have a big People's Party of Canada following. They have a chance, okay? NDP won in 2015 in Alberta. There is a chance for anyone to win. There is, but the thing is, it's not going to be the leaders who are going to shift that dynamic. My point is, it's going to be the people. It has to come. Like, I don't want to use the word grassroots because then it's going to be like, oh, that's just conservative dogma. But no, it has to come from people like you and me from the moms, the dads, the partners, the kids, those who have been affected by, adversely affected by this shift and this laying bare of our inadequate status quo, they're the ones that are actually going to make the difference. Because again, Dax's question to war is the same question to all of us. Are you willing to tolerate it? Are you willing to let it go? And if you're not, then you got to do something about it. You can't wait for someone to come in and save you. Like, this is the whole argument we've had in Alberta since 2015. Alberta doesn't need saving. We don't need a messiah complex. We don't, we shouldn't have a messiah complex. And we don't need a messiah. We need to start actually thinking and collaborating and then addressing these, addressing the issues, not from a place of left or right or right or wrong. But a place of, you know what, when everything's laid bare, we're more alike than we are different. There are some things that are non-negotiables. I have my, I have my lines that I won't cross. And if someone tries to push the other way, well, then you know what, I'll go Peggy Carter on them. And I'll be like, no, you move, plant my tree and go, you know, you move. But if you're willing to work at it and address what's happening, then that, those are the people I want, I want to engage with. Those are the people that should be that we should be hearing more of. Like, sorry, go on. No, and I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna say this in, in a very respectful way to the people who are listening because I always get hate mail when I say this. People need to get off freaking Twitter. They need to get off social media. Social media is a dead, 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 dead place where people go and they spew vile things. And we give oxygen to anyone with a keyboard. It is time to get off Twitter, get off social media, and have conversations like the one Jeremy and I are having right now. Stop thinking that you can solve the world's issues in 180 characters. You can't. You will never be able to. Nothing good has ever come from Twitter or TikTok, for those who have it. I do not. I despise TikTok. I do not get TikTok. I am in that generation that goes, huh? Like my father did when I had ICQ at MSN Messenger. But enough is enough. Get off your phones, talk to people like normal human beings do, and have an intelligent conversation again. That's my two cents on that. Fair enough. And I think you have an interest, you have it, you made an interesting point, Chris. I'm just going to uh, shoot back just casually here for fun. And just because, Let's do well, it. the thing is, pal, as I get where you're coming from, I get where you, what you're trying to say. And I think I'm going to help massage some of it is let's be candid. You and I are both there. We started interacting through the socials. 
That's how no, I got to... no, no. We started interacting through the 2019 uh, provincial campaign. We met by uh, my husband's campaign and we yeah. became Facebook friends. I didn't say Facebook. I said Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I know. But you're, but listen, I was following your story and interacting with you long before then when you were still working for Danielle Larive and you were working up in Slave Lake. So I, that, see, I remember you from there and that's how we interacted because you started sharing pictures of all your star trek books and stuff like that and yes. you're moved down to calgary so let's just put that my point is is there are some positive relations that come up from the from from the socials there are some smart people that are out there and they know just like you that the real change the real transformation the transformative power is not going to come from a keyboard I think there's value. You get an idea. You get it. You get it like a flash of an insight from those people who have taken their time to really deep dive and explore issues. They give you a nugget, but it's an in. But what you do with that nugget is what matters. Are you going to sit there and fester and spew the hate, or are you going to explore? Are you going to investigate? Or are you going to rash? Are you going to dis discover for yourself what they're trying to say? Like you and I both here. Like we both know, like the amazing woman that is like Kathleen, Kathleen Smith. She's like, peace, love her to pieces. She's like one of the, she's, she's phenomenal. But that's, they say, that is her, that is her MO. Like she'll call out crap like you see it if it's deserved, but she tells, she tells her story. She shares some things. There's, uh, let's put the example of example, Dr. Vipond. Let's use Dr. Vipon as an example right now. I know some of these people can be quite polarizing and a little bit here and there, but these are people that's like, I don't need to agree with everything they say, but I'm willing to definitely go and look. It's more than what I knew when I started. So there's a place, but it's moderation. Everything in moderation. But at the end of the day, you're not going to win a campaign on Twitter, but you sure as hell can lose one. And I think that's, I think if I want to see here, that's the takeaway you're trying that's the takeaway you're trying you're trying to make is you're never going to win one but i okay I, I i love these type of conversations because they start political and they go into actually something deep and meaningful which i love having these conversations and i thank you for uh, uh, indulging me in this conversation because i had two interviews today and they were mm. so yeah, I, I appreciate you having this conversation with me but i want to i want to end on this statement sure Twitter is one of these places that has given, like I said, given oxygen to the bad people. Mm -hmm. You look on Twitter right now, people have gotten a voice and they're willing to use it. And I, and I appreciate that. Everyone should have a voice and everyone should be able to use it. And I, I'm, I'm not throwing uh, Miss Kathleen Smith under the bus here. I'm not throwing anything like that. I'm not trying to degrade what she's done, but I'm going to say this. Why her? Why does it take someone like in those powers? Why does it take someone with 2,500, 25,000 followers? Why does it take someone with a blue check mark to get people to stop? Because it doesn't. Okay, you can block them, you can un, you can mute them, all that stuff. But why does it take so? Why doesn't it take the average person like you and me to have that conversation with someone to say you're out of line? Why does it, why do we always have to go back to the influencers? And that's my problem with social media is the influencers. It's the people who think they know better than everyone else. So we have to listen to them. I'm sorry, we don't. I, I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. That is a great tool to connect with people like you and me. Okay, I completely forgot about the Star Trek thing, but yet again, my mind is not the best right now, let's be honest. So I appreciate the fact that I've been able to connect with people and my show has gotten great viewership because of social media. My issue is we give credence to people with blue check marks and everyone's chasing the blue check mark on Twitter. Everyone wants it now. Oh, I want to be verified. I could care two craps. Oh, I mean, like, no, I don't care. I, you know what? Thank you. You have it. You have it. You don't, you don't. End of like, for <laughs> me, that's for me, for me, that for me, that's it. Like, you know what? It doesn't have to be the mm -hmm. power. Like say the reality is, is I'll give a, I will give a, 
I will support a platform for anyone who has gone through, who's gone through hell and back. Like this is just saying who's had, who's had that lived experience. I don't really care who that person is, but I do care if, do you know what, if they're trying to uplift and get me to think and challenge my held beliefs, whether you have a blue check mark or not, trust me, you're going to get my, you're going to get my attention. And it's those, and I say, those are the people that I'm going to, that I'm going to interact with. The check marks mean nothing. It's who you are. That real, that really matters because really words are words, but it's getting to know someone. I was talking with someone today. They're like, wow, it's very rare to get sentences or even paragraphs from people online. I'm like, well, you know what? I'm not a one or I'm not a one, one liner or quick closed question type of person. I want to interact. Right now, the reality is COVID's forced us to have to engage in this manner. And we have to remember how to talk to people. So uh, sorry, no, awesome. On. Awesome. I, I do. I'm just cautious of time here. And I want to make sure that we don't run over time here. But no I, I do. I want to get I want to I want to steer the conversation back to politics for OK, bit, fair enough. Well, Everything's political, but absolutely. I guess we're, we're everything's always political. But let's let's talk about elections. Then let's talk Sounds about elections. Okay. Um, you and I are both in the the riding of Calgary Skyview. Yes. Uh, our current MP is Jag Sahoda, Conservative yes. MP, the Shadow Minister for Women and Gender Equality. I want to make. I want to say. I think that's her official title right now. Okay. Uh, in Aaron O'Toole's Shadow Cabinet. Right. Um, he she is going up for re-election against sitting count sitting ward five councillor and that part of ward 10 because of our councillor stepping down in 2020 yeah, yeah. Uh, mr george Tahal, and yeah. then also the ndp candidate who ran in 2019 and i'm going to pronounce his name wrong here i do apologize to him but gurinder singh gill yeah uh, is uh, the NDP candidate. Harry Dillon is the People's Party of Canada candidate. The Green Party candidate is, I don't remember her name, but she there is a Green Party candidate and there is no Maverick Party candidate in this riding. And I believe those are the only five that will be on the ballot on okay. September 20th. Cool. Um, you, at the beginning of the show, I asked you if you had your candidate chosen, and I, I want to know, and uh, I'll ask you who it is, and but I want to also know why. Why have you chosen to back the, this candidate over the other candidates? Okay, well, you know what? I have, um, geez, it's a, great, it's a great question. I look around and I look at my vote and people could argue, well, if you want to unseat the conservative MP, you need to strategically vote. Personally, I think strategic voting is garbage, but that's a whole other Pandora's box we really don't have time to open. I am voting for the NDP. And the reason for that is a lot of it has to do with what what I mentioned earlier. Has to mention with the fact that our our societal status quo is broken and now is better. Now there's no better time to actually go and shift and transform what they're asking. Now I get there's a lot of flack when you hear the letters NDP in Alberta. Some people are gonna be like evoking memories of, oh my gosh, this is horrible. It's like, oh no, it's another Notley thing or heaven forbid, or listening to it on the radio on other, on other platforms this morning, people were talking about the Leap Manifesto. The first time in like five years, people were talking about it again. Holy crap. Yeah, interesting, interesting conversation. But then the, the conversation went down where you're actually looking at the manifesto now versus when it first came out, you I look at it and read, it's like, this really isn't all that bad. But neither here nor there, those like, it's not the flashy issues. Personally, I believe that there the time has come that we reassess how our, how our economy works, that we reassess our commitment to people. I'm not necessarily going to be one of those people that are going to jump on a bandwagon and rally behind like rally in Paul favor like oh my gosh new deal this new deal that green new deal like I get what people are calling it I get that's the image they're trying to evoke the federal NDP is trying to evoke that image of uh, Miss uh, Miss Cortez out of uh, New York out, out of these yeah <laughs> Miss AOC yeah 
So they're trying to invoke that image. And for some regards, it's going to work for them. But for me, it's one of those things where it's like, when I look at the three parties, I can trust that the federal New Democrats, if committed to their platform and committed to good governance, can actually follow through and would be the best equipped to actually deliver on those on, on those promises. That party rose from Depression era, rose to prominence here in Alberta, was founded in downtown Calgary, right? So there's definitely they they un, they understand the nation. They people view them as an Eastern party, but no, the reality is they were a Western party. They were founded in the West. They were founded in Depression era, Depression era Canada, and that is and that is their that's their forte. Like you go back to that, you go back to those roots, and really think about taking care of people and taking care of of, of taking care of an economy and treating it like like a, like a person, not just like an instrument to be exploited, but taking care of the people who make it work and delivering, make sure they're taking people are supported are fed, are clothed, are healthy, healthy people generate healthy economies, period. Like the universal pharmacare, universe, like prescriptions, all that type of stuff, that all matters. You know what? I'm not, I did not take the least bit of offense when Mr. Singh had mentioned in Quebec, again, it's a nice media headline, we'll rally up, whip up the bases and the hyper partisans in Alberta, when he says we need to end the federal subsidies for energy companies, for oil, for oil and gas companies. Absolutely. Absolutely. The time is, the times come to make those big, those big calls. It's like, we're not saying we're going to get rid of them and shut them down tomorrow. No one's saying that. That's what everyone's assuming, but no one is actually saying that there are some in, there are some in the further social, like the further social Democrat wing of the, uh, of the NDP who would demand it's all done in all done in a day. But Rome wasn't built in a day. Neither were Edmonton or Calgary or anything else. The things that matter took time. They take time. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to slip up. That's what some people have to accept. They want, ra they want radical change. You know what? I'm all for it. But it's not so much change. I hate the word change, Chris. I think change is you're just, you know what? You change your clothes, but you're still wearing clothes. You change your diet. You're still eating food. The idea of it, as I learned this years ago, is that chocolate covered nasty is still nasty. You might want to slap something on it. You might want to put some pudding or some ganache on it. But if the substance is still crap, putting on ganache or something isn't going, isn't going to fundamentally change it. You, what you're looking for is a transformation. You're looking for a paradigm shift. You're shifting the way people think. You're shifting the way people view the world around them. And I believe that if the New Democrats can get their act together and do what they need to do, they can really make some wonders as, um, as, a, as a governing party and having our first NDP prime minister. I honestly believe if Mr. Jack Layton hadn't passed away in 2011, he might be prime minister today. Canada was ready in 2011. They were... They were at that point. They had put the Liberals in third place. And the NDP, for the first time in Canada's history, became the official opposition. They were the government in waiting. With enough, with their boots to the ground, right candidates, right issues, working on those issues that work for them, it can be done. And I'm willing to put their trust in there. Part of that, too, and a lot of that credit, and I'll be candid about it, goes to the provincial NDP here in Alberta. They're the ones that really allowed me to open my eyes and made it safe. Rachel Notley and her team made it safe, made it understandable. I look and I cannot wait to reelect Rachel Notley in 2023 here in Alberta. Another story for another time. But I cannot wait for that because I saw in the provincial party, very different from their federal counterparts in some, in some regards, but the idea of that social justice, that equity, that equality, that treatment of people mattered. Did the government, the provincial government make mistakes? Yeah, they did. Absolutely, who, they did. Who doesn't? They, who, exactly. We're human. We make mistakes. Things happen. The reality is, though, 
was that the for, for a first time in a long time, uh, there was a government in Alberta that gave a damn. And I want to see more of that. I want to see that idea of hope. I don't see it in the concert in the conservatives right now. I see that they're a party very much in deep denial about themselves. I think the merger, I think the merger in hindsight, when I was 17, 18 years old, I was young and stupid and didn't really know what I was doing and was very, for a smart guy, I was very ignorant about some of the issues. So I went along with it back in the day, but it took me going, it took me to serving a church mission in the Ivory Coast to realize the fallacy of those right-wing conservative policies that just, that turned my life around. And you- Ho, 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 let's go back. Back the hypo the hypothetical truck up beep beep beep. <laughs> you were you voted for the merger for the Canadian Alliance and the uh, I was seventeen. Cons- I didn't. I couldn't vote. I wasn't eighteen yet. But, but you I, you were were you were in favor of it because that's and who in- are you? <laughs> you know what? I am somebody who grew up in rural Alberta and grew up in Red Deer somebody who thought that the progressive conservative party of Alberta was doing some good, who believed that, you know what, there are some good things to be had and supported it for a long time. I didn't challenge, I didn't really challenge or question it. I was one of those who did because their parents did it and their family did it. And I think part of it too, was a little bit of a rebellious phase in my own family because my parents were did voted differently than I did and I didn't necessarily see eye to eye with my folks so I did things differently so I was one of those people who when I was younger was definitely more right wing a lot of it too stemmed from an assault I had in 2006 where it was led to believe through trauma that oh I can't let this happen to anybody else I have to work hard and I have to do this so it's very wrapped up in very much wrapped up in that type of dogma that same type of rhetoric that's fueled the federal conservatives and Alberta's UCP now for years. But it didn't it say the paradigm shift for me was taken out of my comfort zone, sent halfway around the world in a world that I did not understand. And I think the moment where I knew that I had completely jumped the, jumped the shark and lost the plot was when I was living in a neighborhood in Abidjan in the Ivory Coast. And I was woken up at 2 a.m. to the sound of a husband beating his wife below my apartment and a child crying. And my window was open. I couldn't do it. I tried to run to another part of the apartment to try and sleep and I couldn't do it. That child's wailing and screaming was too much. And I cried myself to sleep that night. But it was the beginning of that whole shift when seeing people and working with them on the streets and interacting with them in a way that's outside creature comforts, you, I began to see how my whole world had been so miscategorized that it's like, I can't, I came back home a very different person. I know they say the adage is you go further right as you get older. Well, no, I've gone further left since I, since I've been home. As I've gotten older, I have become more and more of a lefty and things that I had suppressed about myself and things I viewed about the world, this equality, this justice for people, the goodness, the heart, good hearts of people. I suppressed that to try and fit in. I did. And it's going to take a lifetime for me to fix that. Like I'm going to be atoning for that for a very, very, very long time. And I think that's important that to recognize as a voter Part of that is too, is it not just to appease my own conscience, but I believe in if you're gonna if you're gonna be forgiven for something, you have to commit to restoring and making restitution for what you did wrong. And that's a lifetime of fixing that type of apathy or fixing that silence just to be just to appeal to the masses. So yeah, back when I was 17, I believe the West should have more of a say. I learned very quickly and learned over years that I was very, very, very wrong. If I can go back to 17 year old Jeremy today, I would tell him, don't you dare, don't you dare even consider this. If it may, like, and I would probably whack myself across the head and say, don't do this, don't do this. 
But I can tell 18 year old Jeremy one thing I'd be like, you're going to end up voting NDP. 18 year old Jeremy couldn't fathom that. But 38 year old Jeremy pretty much understands that that's just the way life goes. And if it makes you feel any better, I know somebody that I follow on social media who was around back when I was 17. And they too were a fan of this United Alternative. And they've absolutely renounced that whole political side of them. They too learned their lesson and are very much fervently anti-Kenny people. So if it happened for me, it can happen to others. But I say, conservative parties in denial about themselves. They don't know who they are. And I don't want to be part of that. The liberal government, you know what? I respect Mr. Call for what he's done here. I respect the work he's done as our, as our, as our councilman. I respect that he would be a fantastic MP and a fantastic uh, representative of Calgary Sky Ridge. And I'll be, be, pra I'll be pragmatic. It's going to be a two horse race between Sahota and George. Like it will be, it'll be a two horse race. However, if the provincial results for any, any indication, Sky Ridge can flip. It's one of those toss up ridings that it can, it can flip. Let's put it this way. Parmeet Singh was only a couple hundred votes. I think it was a hundred votes away from winning as an MLA here in Falcon Ridge. That progressive voice, that mindset, that mentality doesn't just go away because you're voting federally. It still exists. People still remember those things. And I think, I think Sky Ridge is going to be one of those things you're going to have to watch because. I, I agree. Know, I agree completely that. Um, yeah. This riding is going to be uh, an interesting riding on election night. I'm looking forward yeah. to it on September 20th, but I'm just looking at time and I do want to get in one last topic before we do let you go here, Jeremy. Of course. And that is municipal election, municipal election, municipal election, municipal election. Uh, on the show, if anyone has been tuning in or for the viewers who are tuning into the show, first off, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. I appreciate everyone tuning into the show and listening to all the great interviews we have with all the great candidates that are running for municipal council. Okay. <laughs> with saying that, you and I are in the same boat. Yeah. Uh, you, you said earlier on in our pre-interview interview that you are still unknown. You're still doing your research. You're still trying to figure out what, where the candidate stands on some issues, what, what they believe. What is the issue you're looking for in the municipal election that you would want the mayoral candidates and the candidates for Ward 10 to address? I think really stems again back to that fundamental question we talked about on the federal level is what vision do we want to have for Calgary? What vision do we have for this city? A city who, again, is also in very much deep denial about itself, that for so many years had clung to an identity as being oil town or rodeo town. And now when you don't have, when you don't have a rodeo or you have a very different rodeo, and your oil and gas, even though prices of WTI are rising, the jobs aren't coming back, the towers downtown are still empty, you're running into the same type of questions. And the candidates running, some of the candidates running for mayor, are willing to go back to the old status quo and think, oh, well, let's scrap bike lanes, let's scrap art, let's scrap this, let's scrap the green line, let's scrap all this stuff, and let's just go back and artificially deflate downtown property taxes and impose the higher taxes up on the residential areas in order to keep the corporate coffin core, to keep City Hall's coffers full. Like, you're living in, living in a fantasy. It is very much a fantasy and it's not sustainable. I feel for the, for Calgary, we have to look at like, where do we, where do we want to, where do we want to be? Who do we want to be? Or is, do we want to continue building out where our ring road, where Stony Trail and Sutina Trail become part of the inner city? Are we going to keep spreading out? Are we going to annex Airdrie? Are we going to annex Okotoks? Is that- Chest of Mir. Chest of Mir. We're practically <laughs> there. We're practically there. I remember a time where Chestermere actually had separate boundaries from Calgary. 
now I can drive 17th Avenue and be like, oh, look, I'm in Chestermere and I didn't even flip it. But those type of, but those type of things, if you, if you think, if you think about it, that's reality. The reality is, is that do we want this sprawl to continue or do we want it to stop? Do we, how do we want to address um, the issues of bike lanes, different means of transportation, the green line, such a polarizing, such a polarizing issue. I remember living in Ward 11 when the controversial issue was the BRT from the Southwest, the Southwest BRT and how much of a fight it took to get it done. And all this, all the rhetoric and whatnot that came that, that, that I came with that, but ultimately necessary and vital. If we're going to be, if we're going to promote a culture or a city that we want to attract the world and bring the world to, like we all remember when we tried to woo Amazon here, we didn't have, we tried our best, but we didn't have what they were looking for. We didn't, Amazon has an image they want to uphold. They want to uphold an environmentally conscious uh, or, or, or organization, enterprise, whatever it is you want to call it. They want to have X, Y, and Z in place and Calgary didn't check off those things. But yet the County of Rocky View did. <laughs> yeah, I know. Figure that one out. <laughs> but you think, well, this way here, Chris, I was just, I was driving up to Edmonton with a friend um, last week. We're doing some volunteer work and he's telling me about the budgets of the Calgary fire department and Rocky view. See Rocky view, you work less hours and you get paid a whole lot more. You go to different stations, but yeah, there's you're spread out more, but you get paid a whole lot more for doing a whole lot less work. Calgary, you're answering almost 10 times the calls, and their budgets and their budget is crap, and they are now trying, and they're trying to negotiate through some funky mathematics, trying to make it sound good. But it's like, no, you're working more overtime and you're getting less pay. Like, how is that? How is that right? Again, let's keep going. If we're going to talk about more municipal issues, let's look at let's look at BLM. Let's look at police reform. Do we slash the police budget? Do we so contribute more into mental health like i'll be a uh, disclaimer here i might be a progressive voter but i'm still a very much a fan and a volunteer at times with the calgary police service i believe in the good they do i believe there's room for improvement i don't believe slashing their budget to nothing is the answer but i do believe there is room and there should be room to take away to take the cops out of the roles of mental health advocates and mental health workers when they're not and allow actual experts in mental health in counseling whatever it is you need and go in there and let police be enforcement you enforce the law you're not here to resolve all these other issues and we dump it on them expecting to do it because we don't want to do it ourselves so there's two sides of that there's two sides to that coin advocates will be like oh dump it all dump it all and it's like well, no, there's still a place. The question is, you need to redefine what that looks like. Candidate, mayor, city council has to define that. The mayoral candidates have to define that. I believe there is one candidate out of the front runners who really gets it. I believe there's one in the front runners that would go back and say that I'm completely wrong and would sit in my wrongness and be wrong and will be like, no, we need to give them more. You don't know what you're talking about. It's like, no, dude, stuff has to happen. I come from a family of cops. My dad was a cop for 20 some years. My dad would be the first one to agree. It's like, you know what? I'm not a counselor. I'm not a grief worker. I'm not a social worker. And yet you're asking me to do it. Like he got done. He was done. And that's, and that's with the RCMP. But you have to address the racial issues yeah. that affect in, in the city. You have to address the targeted hate. Like those are things that are not going away. Like Calgary is a microcosm for the country as a whole. The same questions that are impacting Canada are also impacting Calgary. We're now dealing with a fourth wave of COVID-19. We have outgoing city councillors who are insisting that we recall city council early to have an emergency debate about reinstating a masking bylaw. This issue isn't going, isn't going to go away. The new council is going to have to address that. There are plenty of candidates in the upcoming election from what the platforms and stuff I can read that um, would be would be of the lines of 
no, 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 no. We don't need this. We don't need this. Let's say fair. Let's say fair this. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. We don't need to worry about a bylaw. It's just, it's just a flu, right? They would take the same approach that the premier of Alberta and his health minister would take. And they'd probably go on vacation with them too, because we really don't know where they are. Anyway, not the point there. Yes, that was a dent. That was a jab. And I, 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 I felt that job from four blocks away, Jeremy. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. But no, but these are the things that council has to, has to look at. They're, we're looking at, you mentioned earlier at the top of the broadcast that the Stampeders, the Flames, they're requiring negative tests or vaccine records. Edmonton's done the same. Edmonton's done the same thing. Hell, you want to go to British Columbia? You want to go to Fernie? You're going to have to have a vaccine card, right? What is the city? What's the city going to do? We have schools. What are we going to do with some of the schools here? We have people running for trustees. One of the big issues is going to come down to the Catholic system is how does the Catholic school board reconcile its own past with the resident, with, with the residential school system? Those are, I see if you're the people who get my vote or will get my vote are those who are willing to address and talk about those issues. I'll be honest, it's hard in 10 because I don't really know. People have been very ambiguous. I have had no one come knocking on my door. No one's come, no one's even tried, even a socially distanced knock on my door and talk about issues. I've had the odd brochure show up, nothing substantial. I know more about two of the candidates in Ward 3 that I wish I could transplant one of them to 10 and that way I can get both of them in city council because there's two fantastic candidates in three that Calgary deserves both of them. And that'd be Jasmine Meehan and Nate Pike. Like, the, like seriously, the two of them run, have run, in my opinion, the best campaign that the city has seen in a very, very, very long time. I love them both, but we don't- I have, have talked to some amazing candidates okay. across this city. They yeah. all have their, they all are doing it for the right reasons. They all Good. believe in what they're doing. And I will, I am not trying to say that those two aren't. I've only talked to one of those two, but uh, Ward 3 has a very challenging uh, election on their hands. Oh, absolutely. They do. Absolutely. And I'm saying, I'm sorry. I know people are going to be like, who is this Jeremy guy who dares to shoot off his mouth like this? I'm just speaking from where, speaking from my, from my vantage point, the way, the way the way it's been seen and presented to me it's my reality but you know what it's also open to interpretation it's also open to hey if there's new information then by all means gladly share it but whoever is going to earn my vote in october are going to be those that are going to present us a view of what they want calgary to be the vote for mayor i believe i'm about 45 percent locked in as to whom i'm going to vote for i'm not going to disclose that at this time i'm going to choose not to and However, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I think you're probably going to change your mind in a few weeks. You know what? I probably will. I, I am saying I will talk to you after the broadcast ends, but I'm saying that you will probably change your mind after a few weeks, or you, you might even be locked in even closer because of something that's going to come out here soon. Okay, um, but yeah, so that's it. Chris, whoever's going to get it, will give me a view of Calgary's future, not necessarily stuck in Calgary's past and not willing to deflect or ignore, ignore the issues affecting all of us. So taxation, what are we going to do to balance? What are we going to do to counterbalance this art, this, the artificial deflation of property taxes in the core? How are we going to handle sustainable transportation? How are we going to handle bringing incentivizing jobs, modernizing schools, making sure that our city is built to last, that we're actually bringing in innovation. We're, we're leading ourselves. We're not waiting for the province or the country to do it. Whoever's gonna do it is gonna take the bull by the horns and they're gonna get their hands dirty and they're gonna get, and they're gonna get it done. That's who's going to earn my vote in October. And I think that's the best way I can leave it at right now. I, I think that's the best way to leave it at the, the entire episode. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, because we have we have just hit the hour mark, literally just hit the hour mark. Uh, for those who are listening and to, uh, uh, tuning in, it might not be officially an hour because we did have some technical issues earlier on the episode. Literally five minutes into the episode, both of our internets or one <laughs> of our internets decided to say, hey, we're not going to work for you this morning. God bless high speed internet. You think we'd be able to fix this in 2021 as we are doing this. Um, Jeremy, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I, I always get so much out of you. I, I always enjoy talking to you. I always enjoy the Star Trek tidbits that you throw in, no matter what type of conversation we're having. So I will have you back on the show. I guarantee it before this election is done on September 20th. And also before the election is done on uh, October 18th. Just want to make sure I got the date correct there. I always get Something that. like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but to my listeners and to my viewers, I want to thank you so much for tuning in, for watching, for downloading, for streaming. Uh, I do want to make a special shout out to our newest backer of the show, uh, Miss Vicki Bayford. She just uh, uh, donated some money to the show, monthly donation on Patreon. If you want to do the same, please go to Patreon, do donate $2, $3, $5. If you want to donate $500 a month, that'd be greatly appreciated for me. It does help us uh, produce the show, edit the show, but we are also bringing new things to the show. So thank you so much. Jeremy, once again, greatly appreciate it for being in the show, sitting down, taking time out of your afternoon and just chatting with me. Or I guess when this is airing, taking time out of your busy morning to sit down and talk to me. So thank hey, you, Hey, well, it's, well, it's going to be in the morning. It's certainly... It certainly beats auditing driver files. So this was this was fun. So to all your to all your fans and all your viewers and subscribers, well, I just wish you a little live long and prosper there. So there you go. Awesome. Uh, with that, thank you so much for tuning in. Greatly appreciate it. And we will be back tomorrow morning, Friday morning, with our entertainment rundown with our entertainment uh, beat reporters. So tune into that. With that, have a safe day, everyone, and chat to you guys later.